Hello. Well, I lost the daylight in the time that I've been trying to set this up, but what are you going to do? So I apologize for the poor lighting, um, but it's clouding over outside. So what little light I had available is now all just fluorescence. Um, given that this is the week that the University of Hartford is closed, I'm not working in my office today. I am actually at the uh, Otis Library in Norwich and using one of their study rooms and trying not to be too loud about it because even though people do have meetings and talk in the study rooms all the time, it's still a library and I feel like I should be very, very quiet. Um, if this does work out, that's probably where I'll be doing these this week because my plan this week is to get caught up on all of the um, readings that I didn't include in my blog and therefore blog this quarter because the quarter kind of got away from me and I have a feeling that's going to happen again next quarter which starts on Monday the 4th. So my goal again get it all caught up now um, and also tweak my blogging skills in the meantime which looking back over the previous quarter um, I put everything that I did for that course into an e-portfolio and then promptly locked it away from the entire internet because looking at all the thumbnails for all of those videos, yes, very steep learning curve there. And it's a learning curve that I am definitely still on. Um, figuring out how to angle the tablet, which at the moment is propped on the collected biographies of FDR, JFK, and Bill Clinton, and is being kept from tilting back by this very interesting book on the stories of doctors and nurses in the U.S. Civil War, and um, which I read while I was waiting for a bunch of stuff to get cleared out of the memory on this thing so I could actually do this vlog. The, um, the other thing you might notice has had a little tweaking is I'm actually wearing makeup. There is nothing like vlogging to make you rethink your life choices around makeup. Um, as in, there's a reason people who make their living on camera do it in makeup. Um, whereas typically I've been somebody who doesn't wear it very often or only on very special occasions. And so I've had to learn a bit about how to actually apply it appropriately for what I'm trying to do here. Some of the YouTubes that are linked down below on my WordPress blog, and I'll also link them in the description box on YouTube, are some of the makeup blogs I've been checking out over the last week or so, um, trying to learn a little bit more than just how to slap on a little blush. Um, and if any of you are the people from those vlogs who are wondering who the heck this woman is who's been all of a sudden thumb upping a bunch of your videos, that, that's me and that's why. Um, but the process of that has also given me a lot to think about around makeup, the choice to wear it, to not wear it, pressure to wear it, pressure to not wear it, um, and how that interacts with health and also social determinants of health. And so there will be an entry specifically on just that stuff, but in order to be consistent with everything, I need to find some peer-reviewed articles and other stuff to link to um, in order to actually make that happen. But hopefully that'll happen by the end of this week. If not, then it'll probably be between this quarter and the spring quarter. Um, that said, I see from the clock I'm already almost four minutes in, and I haven't talked about a single thing to do with what this post is supposed to be about, which is sexual orientation and how in the world we define it. That was the first set of readings that we had to do for the course on studying rare, marginalized, and hidden groups. And on the WordPress blog below, you will see that I've actually pasted in the written response to those readings that I originally did. And um, several of the readings were actually things that my professor, Dr. Sal, either had written or had contributed to. Um, I went out on a bit of a limb and criticized the measuring tool he developed. Um, I actually really like the idea that of looking at three different dimensions of attraction, behavior, and identity. Um, my issues were more that the 
behavior section only looked at the past year of a person's life, which if someone's in a committed relationship can make them look monosexual, if they are, even if they are in fact not by any rational standard that I would consider a rational standard. Um, and the identity section still had a very polarized thing where you rated either how heterosexual or how hom and how homosexual you perceived yourself to be, which for most people who are neither of those things, they're going to come out as asexual even if they're not. And even though, for example, bisexuals and asexuals, we have no problem hanging out together, we actually have quite a few health issues in common, it might not be a bad thing to study us together, but you probably don't want us hanging around completely undifferentiated in your data sets. Um, so I think that still needs some work, not that I have an alternative to propose at this point in time. Who knows, maybe that'll end up being my doctoral pro project whenever I'm actually doing one. Um, anyway, um, there were some interesting things that came up um, that I want to look into a little more, such as one of the articles, the Medanic et al. 2007 article, um, showed that women who actually were having sex with other women as opposed to simply their sexual orientation identity, including an attraction to women, were using more alcohol than those who it was simply part of their identity, which raises the, quest the chicken and egg question. Is it that consuming more alcohol is leading to being less inhibited and actually engaging in more sexual behavior, or is it that being engaged actively in sexual relationships with other women was increasing minority stigma, minority stress, um, and leading to more pressure to use substances such as alcohol to reduce that stress. Um, it didn't address that, it simply discovered the correlation. Um, there was one article that was referenced in that which, can I find it? Of course, I'm reading my original on my phone because at my office, I usually have the tablet and the desktop going, but that doesn't really work in the library. Um, Shively and DeSico from 1977, which I have yet to read the original article. I think I still have an outstanding request for it um, through the University of Hartford Library or possibly through the University of Drexel Library. This is where things get confusing, working at one place and going to school at another. Um, but one of the things they looked at were physical and affectional preferences se separately, which I thought was intriguing because these days we hear a lot from the asexual population about the distinction between sexual attraction and romantic attraction. And this is the first time I've really run across an actual um, official research tool that looks at those two things separately. There is precious little study being done on asexuals at this point in time that I'm aware of. Um, and I'm hoping to find that maybe some are using either that tool or something like it to determine, you know, how to measure these subjective experiences of these more granular definitions of attraction um, and how they impact people health-wise and just how how to understand that better. Um, anyway, so the, the articles were defining and measuring sexual orientation for research, uh, the cell assessment of sexual orientation, sexual orientation and alcohol use, identity versus behavior measures, and then a TED talk by Io Tillett Wright, uh, Fifty Shades of Gay, which I highly recommend that you click in the description or blog post and go watch because it's a wonderful TED talk. I mean, um, most TED talks are great, but this one is really particularly good. Um, and yeah, bottom line is that there are different things you need to look at when you're trying to officially measure what sexual orientation is. Um, and the, the three pretty much are attraction, behavior, and identity. And But how we actually measure those and make sure that our measurement makes some kind of sense to what we're studying 
can vary a lot. Um, one of the things that ended up being my overall conclusion for the course was that to make sure that we're not missing people, we need to use the broadest definitions possible when we're gathering data and gathering subjects, but then we need to look as granularly as possible at these different dimensions so that we have some understanding, okay, so here are all the people who consider themselves part of this population and how do we then measure each of these aspects and how they impact their people's health um, or their ability to access health care or any of that sort of thing. Um, and maybe at some point I'll actually make that a little more coherent, write it up and try to get it published someplace. But in the meantime, that's kind of where I'm at, um, which is kind of where I've been all along. Um, as I've been reading in this subject area, one of the things that has frustrated me was when I've seen definitions that didn't make a whole lot of sense that were either too narrow or absurdly broad or the name of the definition was really narrow. There's one in particular that I'll talk about when I get into, um, I think it's the sampling section, where the, defin the, the title of the article and the intent of the article was about studying transgender women, but the way that they were defining transgender women would, in my opinion, also include people who would be genderqueer, gender fluid, agender, non-binary, any number of other non-cisgender identity of people who were assigned male at birth. I'm not sure that's really helpful. For what they're studying, maybe that was all that mattered, but words mean things, as my friend Jolene is so fond of saying. And however, like the um, Cheshire Cat said, they can mean more than one things depending if we pay them extra. And often words do mean different things depending on context. And so for research purposes, we need to really nail down what we mean without then sticking people in little boxes that don't necessarily fit. Um, so that's an interesting balancing act to try to achieve. And I don't have a, you know, brilliant answer to how to magically just fix that with a touch of a button, but I do think it's something we need to be mindful of. And that's probably a theme that's going to come up over and over again as I go through the rest of these um, sections playing catch up. And I'm at 12 and a half minutes already, which is far longer than I had intended to be babbling. So I'm going to stop now and just say, um, if you're interested in actually reading any of these articles, one is actually a chapter from a book. The information is below, um, as is the link to the TED Talk. And if you're interested in checking out any of the makeup tutorial people that I mentioned um, back at the beginning, they are also linked um, in the description box if you're on YouTube, in the blog post if you're on WordPress. And I'm going to say goodbye and see you probably tomorrow, depending on the weather we are supposed to be getting some kind of snow. Um, I'm hoping not, but anyway, bye.